We don't have an inter uh, much of an introduction today, so I'm going to jump right in. I'll tell, uh, tell you who we have uh, with us. I'm going to go alphabetical by publication or by name today. Last time I went alphabetical by publication. We have Lynn Burks, who is the owner and editor-in-chief of Rotorcraft Pro Magazine. We have Ned Dawson, who is the owner of Kiha Kaha Media, publisher of Heliops Frontline, Heliops, Heliops Frontline and Air Attack Magazines. And we have Mike Reno, uh, publisher and owner of Vertical and Valor, who are the, which are the Rotorcraft magazines. And he also has Wings, which is a uh, fixed wing publication that we don't talk about uh, in this webinar. Uh, this webinar is interactive. Uh, we know you have questions. We wanna hear your questions. Please ask them. Um, please use the question module in the bottom of the screen uh, to ask the questions. That's the one that I'm gonna primarily be focused on today. Uh, Ned Dawson has asked if you could use the chat feature to uh, plug it in and let us know what city and country you're viewing from today. This webinar is being recorded. Um, we will make the recording available as early as possible tomorrow. It usually takes uh, anywhere from 12 to 24 hours to get things posted, but we will make sure it gets posted as early as possible. And speaking of recordings, uh, we are going to try to avoid focusing on some of the same topic, uh, focusing, pun intended, um, avoiding the same questions we already discussed in the first webinar. If you missed that first webinar, go back to rotor.org slash webinars and look for the one on October 28th. Um, as long as you're there, you might find some other webinars that uh, you might enjoy as well. We uh, try to cover a lot of different topics with this series. So I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to invite uh, Lynn Burks, Ned Dawson, and Mike Wiener to join me today. Gentlemen, appreciate uh, your coming in this close to the holidays. Uh, obviously, we had so much fun in the first uh, webinar that we just had to come back. And uh, who knows how, you know, how often this might happen. But uh, thanks for joining us today. You know, it's a pleasure to be back. Yeah, thanks. Always good. Hey, okay, we're going to run a little bit different format. Uh, we're going to have everybody keep their cameras on today. So, uh, but Ned, let's get started with you. Um, one of the things I know we want to talk about, well, what are good camera angles and how can you shoot with available light? So maybe you could uh, start by addressing that topic today. Yeah, like one of the interesting things is we were chatting about this before is a lot of photographers when they're sort of starting out and sending photos to myself or Mike or Lynn, they'll just send in photos showing side on shots um, or just one particular angle. Um, I just wanted to share a few shots which shows you the... There's, there's so many different angles that you can play with, um, you know, out there um, that I thought, you know, it's, oh, can everyone see that screen yet or not? I'm only seeing in about half the, uh, about half, well, just the top line of the image right now, Ned. Okay, let me try this. Oh, okay, I see what I've done. Uh, I'm still only seeing part of it. Okay. Mike or come back to me, you, Dan, let, let Mike do his and then come back to me. I've, I've got a little hiccup. Okay, not a problem. Well, Mike, let's talk with you. Um, <laughs> let's talk about backgrounds and uh, how to tell the whole story in okay. photography. Um, Ned, you're still sharing your screen there. Okay, let me stop share. Cool, there we go. Sorry. So this is where I, I was able to practice what we were uh, what we were showing. <laughs> so um, so I guess one of the things to to uh, to add on to what Ned was talking about was, you know, obviously, Ned's going to be talking about camera angles and things like that. And one of the things that we see for all three publishers is that a lot of times we're getting a lot of the same types of images. So it's uh, images. It's a it's a side profile image. Um, it's typically in, in level flight, um, and there's nothing that's really interesting about it. Or you may get um, images that someone has gone and they've, uh, it could be a military exercise that they've gone on, or it could be an operator profile. And again, what's happened is they focused in on the aircraft. They didn't focus in on the whole mission that they've, um, that they were there to cover. So um, a lot of us are, you know, we call us aviation geeks, where that's where our focus is, and we focus in on the helicopter, but there's so much more to tell the story. So um, it's the people behind the helicopter. It's, it's uh, demonstrating uh, through your visit that if it's a, um, uh, depending on the, the type of operator, this is the mission that they do. So what I've done is that um, I just took uh, two different operators here. So I'll, I'll share my screen. Yes. Um, so if, uh, can everyone see that? Got it. 
Okay, so here's a good example of a of an operator profile. We did this with um, uh, Department of Natural Resources, and this was in uh, Nova Scotia in uh, in Canada. And we were there for the day, and uh, this particular operator has four brand new H125s. Um, so they do a variety of different uh, of different missions. But what I wanted to do is was capture a the element of of where they're operating in Nova Scotia, which is Nova Scotia is on the east coast of Canada. So you're going to get a lot of the lighthouse side of things. So here is a stage shot. So there's a combination in here, what we're showing with, uh, with stage shots. And this is where now my screen doesn't want to do what it's supposed to do. Um, Cause it's not changing the photo. There we go. Okay. So there's now it's catching up. So there's a combination of stage photos that we do, um, and then there's ones as we're flying along that I'm just taking the photos as we're uh, as we're flying in formation to the next um, the next sequence of that photo shoot. So you're trying to capture the whole essence of the operation. So now we're going into the cockpit. We're showing the pilots flying the aircraft. We're showing what the cockpit configuration is. There's a lot of people that like to, to look at and say, okay, well, I can see what the avionics is that they've equipped the aircraft with. Sometimes you're actually looking at, um, depending on the mission, there's people that want to look at, hey, what kind of equipment are they wearing? What kind of helmets are they wearing? So there's a, kind of, there's a lot of different things that you have to look at is like, how can you capture um, the essence of the mission? How can you capture where they're operating? And this is what I was able to do with, or demonstrate here with Nova Scotia is that, you know, show that it's an East Coast uh, element, show the rugged terrain that they operate in, um, show the people side. Without people, none of this is possible. So instead of just a typical, you know, standing around, okay, how can we make it so it's a little bit more interesting? How can you bring out some of the personalities in this? Um, I have to say in this particular photo, the gentleman with the plaid shirt, um, with his foot up on, this, on the skid, he actually had a broken arm when we were when we took that photo and he didn't know it was broken, but his smile was actually he was crying because he was in so much pain for this, um, but we needed to be part of it. Um, take opportunities where you can bring all the helicopters together. Um, this was a shot um, over one of the um, it's a kind of a unique river that's there and it's all mud um, that particular time of day. Uh, the tide is in. Um, later in the afternoon, the tide was out, and that was all mud there. It's very high tidal waves or tidal uh, waters there. So this one was just taken from a from a cliff. So it brought the whole fleet together to show all the uh, all the helicopters that they operate. Again, brought in someone else. Um, this was a con conservation uh, person to show the mission that they're doing when they're doing conservation type work. Um, brought in law enforcement. Um, they also support the local law enforcement agencies. So brought in the the uh, the K9 unit so since they operate all over the province of Nova Scotia they would uh, they would support K9 um, also an, another very very important part uh, when you're covering operators and they I see a lot of people always forget about it is the maintenance aspect these guys are guys and gals are very critical to the mission of helicopter operators and they really should not be forgotten so one of the things that we're very cognizant of at uh, at vertical and valor is we want to make sure that we're highlighting those people as well. Um, they don't get a lot of the limelight, so that's uh, that's an important uh, function. Uh, again, this was on uh, ground search and rescue. They do work with um, some of the civilian agencies as well for doing uh, doing support for missing person um, firefighting. That's another big uh, element of uh, of the mission is the firefighting aspect. So here we are flying with uh, with Bambi buckets. So we want to show that they do have a firefighting capability. Again, showing um, from the cockpit um, as we're like, this was not a stage photo. Um, this is actually just, we're, we're flying along and we're making a, making a turn. Actually, if you look in his visor, you can see uh, I've, I've got a 10 millimeter lens on there that we're, uh, that we're photographing uh, him with. So by the time that this uh, particular shoot um, was done, it gives you a very, a very good idea of, of um, what this operator does. Um, I'm going to show you uh, one more here, and this one now is from a uh, law enforcement perspective, and it's the same. Uh, it's the same thing here, and let's share my screen again. Okay, so again, this was Seminole County Sheriff. This is down in Florida. Um, 
brand new H-125. Uh, this is a helicopter that Metro Aviation had, uh, had done a completion on. And this is, at the time, was probably one of the most advanced law enforcement helicopters uh, that, was, uh, that was out there. Um, so these guys are located not far from Orlando, went down and again, wanted to highlight everything they do. So we're there at the, uh, this was important for him, that's the uh, courthouse. So we want to show, um, and this is what's happening to me again. It's like this takes a second, uh, there's a lag on here. So I apologize. Um, there we go. See, so all of a sudden it just, it just jumps ahead, it catches up. Um, so here's, we're demonstrating the mission of Seminole County Sheriff. So basic stuff, um, they wanted to do the courthouse. Um, this is one of the few law enforcement agencies in Florida that actually operates an H-125 with a hoist. So we wanted to be able to sh show that they have a search and rescue capability. So um, you're highlighting those operations. Again, getting that human element into it, um, working with the, uh, with the SAR crews. Um, in this case, we were bringing in the, uh, the fire department as well that we were working with them, uh, brought in the dive team. So a lot of times with law enforcement, they work with a lot of specialty units. And this is what we did is we brought in all the units that they work with, uh, dive team, which was the fire department. In this case, we brought together, there's, it was the sheriff's department with one of their boats, the fire department with one of theirs. Um, this actually was a fun one where the, uh, they wanted to work with the, uh, with the airboats. Um, they do do a lot with the airboats in the, especially in the Everglades areas. Um, so they wanted to be able to, uh, to highlight that, uh, that work. Um, this shot was, uh, obviously they work with the, um, with the SWAT teams, but here's a, actually a good example of being very sensitive of what you're shooting. So when I showed up there, this shot is actually taken at a school. They were there to do training at a local high school. And I tried to explain to the commander of the SWAT team that the image that that would be projecting was probably not the right image to have a SWAT team with an armored vehicle and a helicopter at a high school. So this is where you have to have the better judgment is like, how can I do this where I'm not showing that we're actually at a high school? I didn't, for, for me personally, I didn't think that was the correct image to be portraying of how they're using law enforcement. Um, it was part of a training mission. So we shot it that way, but for others that don't understand, I just thought it was best that we shot it in this uh, in this manner, and this is what we uh, this is what we did. So again, it's it's sometimes you have to use good judgment of of the image that you're showing of a operator, but still being able to tell that story. They operate two helicopters, so we're able to use um, uh, Volusia County Sheriff. They brought their Bell 407 in, so we were able to get an, an air to air uh, photo. Again, getting that cockpit photo showing the uh, the area that they're operating in. Um, this is Steve Ferris. He's the um, uh, the the lead on the um, program. Uh, you want to show things that are unique for a unit. So in this case, the sheriff department they have their own elite uh, flight simulator. Very very rare that you have a law enforcement unit that has their own simulator. So highlighting some of those things that to show that this is a uh, a very well-rounded law enforcement agency, what they're doing, the people behind it. So here again, we have uh, all the, uh, the different pilots and tactical flight officers and their, uh, their mascot Chihuahua that's, uh, that's there in the photo. Um, and then the final thing that we finished off with is that um, they were just doing training with using um, snipers from the helicopters. So that was one of the things that we were privy to as well. Um, out on a range. So again, it's just demonstrating in photos that when you come away with this without having to read a story, you get an idea of this is everything that um, uh, with what a law enforcement agency does. So I think that's one of the critical things that a lot of times I see that photographers do miss is that they're not covering the entire story. They're just focused in on the, uh, on the aircraft. Quick question for you there, Mike. Um, I know film is a thing of the past. You know, we don't have to worry about frame counts anymore. When you go out for an assignment to shoot, to tell a story, how many images do you go back with? I mean, I'm not talking about the ones you want to use in the publication, yeah. but how many do you shoot during an average uh, shoot? I would say, so Seminole County Sheriff is a good example. That was there for, for a day, and I probably came back with over 3,000 images. Um, so that would be typical. And of that, by the time you, you're going down and you're picking out those, those ones that, you know, not all the duplicates, you probably have, I would walk away with typically about 100 images that are unique images. And then that then becomes the challenge is, okay, what, what images are using the magazine? 
Uh, but now because of, you know, with the, with the online side, the magazine side, the social media, social, social media channels, that you're able to get those out into the different areas. Um, so usually I find that uh, for me, um, for Ned and, and Lynn, it might be different. Uh, for shots like this, I've got a three to a five year shelf life. Okay, well, actually, let's throw that question out to Lynn and uh, Ned then, too, before we move back to Ned's uh, photos. Well, gentlemen, what's, what's shelf life on your images? Oh, well, for me, I've, I've still got stuff there that I've shot, you know, 25, 30 years ago. Um, a lot of it you can use for historical articles. Um, how Mike and I have been shooting for probably about the same amount of time, so we can go back if we're talking about an operator that might have the brand new H125. Well, we can also go back to how, when they had Bell 47s and we've, we've got those in our files. Um, and it also, there's, there's not really any shelf limit for an image. You look at some of the ones we were talking about on yesterday on the, the run through of Ted Veal's shot of the Columbia Chinook towing the barge. That was shot, what, 40 years ago? And it's still probably one of the most popular images out there. Lynn, what about for you? Yeah, I'm, I'm with Mike. I've got a shelf life of about five years. The one thing that's a little bit different for me is that when I go to a shoot, I'm, I've shifted my focus from photography to videography. And um, we, we've changed the way we do it. And I'm, I'm going to say that I spend 70% of my effort and focus while on location getting quality videography and the other 30% focusing on photography. I, Mike is, is totally right. You know, it, same with Ned. Ned was talking a minute ago about somebody sending him a bunch of photos of just a helicopter on the side. Um, we we got to have the, you should have a shot list when you go into these. We want to see the aircraft, but we want to see the cockpit. We want to see the facilities even. Sometimes these people have really nice training facilities inside and out. And they really want to show those buildings off. So uh, facilities, people, always maintenance when you, if there are maintenance folks around, always maintenance. And then you have to have that specific focus on the essence of what the operator does. That's where the bulk of your focus to be. What is the essence of what this organization is doing? So for me, I'm spending more time on video and less time on photography. So I might come back with maybe uh, 1,200 photos, you know, 900 to 1,200 photos, because I'm switching between cameras very quickly all the time running around. So there you go. Okay, well, there's like three questions that I want to do follow up on that. Um, actually, let's just go ahead and do it, because I know one of the questions we had that uh, popped up that was kind of uh, important to a couple of uh, people. Do you change lenses during a, an air-to-air -air shoot? So, uh, well, actually, I'll... I'll start, and I know Ned's Ned's going one way, and I'm going the other. Uh, so it so it depends. Yes, I have changed lenses on a on an air to air shoot. Um, it just depends on if I'm shooting a single. There's parts of a photo shoot, so you're shooting multi aircraft. So let's say there's I'm in a in a photo ship, and I have three other aircraft that I'm photographing. This happened recently. I was shooting uh, Volusia County Sheriff. Um, so we had three in the formation. Uh, I was on one lens, and then we ended up going to one on the formation and then I had to switch lens to bring him in closer. Uh, so sometimes you just have to adapt on the uh, on the fly. Um, but typically my um, my go to lens for air to air is going to be my 70 to 200. That's typically where I stick with. But sometimes depending on the on the formation, I may have to switch. OK, Ned, what was the uh, counterpoint? <laughs> um, I learned the hard way a long time ago using slide film that the back of a A star 407, whatever, is a very dusty environment. And no matter how much preparation you do, you'll never get rid of all the, the dust and crap flying around. Um, I, back in those days, I had one camera body, a couple of lenses, and I would chop and change. But then when you go to edit the images later on, you get all these little specks on the screen, which have ended up in there. So, I gradually worked into having two bodies and then depending on what I'm actually shooting, I'll, if, it, if it's just shooting air to air at that stage, I'll usually have one body with a 24 to 70, one body with a 70 to 200 and they don't change. If I'm doing like some of the shots that Mike's got with your wide angles, 
I'll take a third body and that will have on a wide angle or a fisheye or whatever. Sometimes if you're doing that, you have to guess on what's going to work for the cockpit. Shots of Mike's there, he nailed it, right, the right lens for the right situation. And you get to know that after time. Okay, I'm in the left seat of a H125. I know I can get away with a, you know, 12 to 24, or I need the fisheye. Um, but I've, I've always just tried to stay one lens, one body, and leave it like that. Lynn, what, what are your thoughts? So I've been shooting the Sony A7, you know, mirrorless full frame with an image sensor for the last three years now. And I can tell you one of the, the advantages of, of shooting this is video. It's incredible video. You can get to it very quickly and you can switch back to photography. It's not as easy when it's on a gimbal, but I managed to do it. The downside is, is you really do not want to change lenses in an operational environment. You don't want to be in the back of the aircraft. You don't want to be on the ground. I learned the hard way early on. I was with uh, U.S. Customs at the National Air Training Center, and they were flying around and throwing up dust and grass, and I just threw open the camera bag, pulled off one lens, and threw on another. Well, guess what? I got a little speck of something on uh, the image sensor, oh. and it, it seems to amplify it pretty badly. Um, you're, you're okay, uh, you know, if you're up in the high high range, you know, F-22, whatever, but you start getting down to low F-stops, you're going to see something, and it's not very good. So I learned do not change if you can help it. Two bodies is probably the best way to go. I'd probably have my wide on one and then my middle lens, you know, uh, on the other, which is uh, um, 24 to 70 on the other body and don't change if you can help it. Okay, um, actually that's a good transition into the second question that I had from what you mentioned a minute ago. Um, you were saying you shoot to 70% video and then about 30% still photos. With that camera, are you able to get usable still frames from the video? I shoot 4K most of the time and yes, you can. I, I have on a very rare occasion pulled an image out of video. However, there is a distinct difference in the way it looks. The color is different. It's not nearly as clear. And when you're throwing that into a layout with other photographs, uh, I feel like you can distinctly see the difference. So I do not rely on that at all. I try to make photography, photography and videography, videography. Okay, makes sense. Well, let's jump back to what we were originally trying. Ned, you want to try your slides again or your uh, images again and talk about uh, the camera or the uh, angles on the ships? Yeah, absolutely. And sorry about the hiccup before. I tried to do something, but didn't quite work. Hey, okay. we, we all uh, understand technology is not our friend. True. Now, one of the things that Mike and I and Lynn and even obviously wrote on that always look for is something different. And it's about going out there and finding those or setting up those images that give you a different look at an aircraft. Most people will shoot side on, a little bit from the front, but think about the helicopter. You can shoot from all, you know, you've got 360 degrees, round, above, forward, backwards, everything. Now, these are just a couple, a few images that I'll show. Just a second here. Okay, share screen. Let's see if I've got this right. Okay, we got it this time. Got it this time. Cool. Okay. For example, like the Bell 49 is actually quite a nice looking helicopter. I was working with the Slovakian police in a place called Nitra in Slovakia. And we decided, okay, we're working with SWAT guys. They got guns. Let's get out the front and shoot back looking at them. Background worked. And again, going back to what Mike has said before about how the background can actually be very important in helping it, you know, an image stand out. This one, we had nice light. Uh, we had the two guys um, on the side of the aircraft, obviously aiming straight towards me, but there were no bullets in the weapons. So that was a good plus. But as you can see, the head on shot from most helicopters is actually a quite a nice angle. Now I'll go to this next one here. Well, he's doing that. I think it's interesting that both he and Mike have had uh, images where they're uh, got people aiming guns at them. <laughs> at least it's by choice <laughs> all 
Okay, this, this one, we were down on the bushfires in Victoria, Australia. And I was up with a friend of mine, Rigsy, in the air attack platform. And we'd been getting photos of this aircraft. What you don't actually see in real life is that long line is about 200 foot in length. And trying to capture anything of a helicopter doing long line bucketing on a fire that's not a vertical format image is a pain. So we had a chat with the crew and said, hey, look, would you fly straight underneath us? We want to get a couple of cool shots looking straight down. And it actually worked out really well. It's a unique angle of the Chinook. But again, it's one of those photos that stands out because it's out of the ordinary. It's not, um, you know, your standard side-on type shot. Um, now let's go to this next one. Screen share. Okay. Now, this shot, can everyone, you can see that okay, Dan? Yep. Right. Okay. Again, this one, you don't get many people that actually shoot from above because people don't think it'll look any good. Well, this one was of uh, Welk Aviation in California. The guys were out doing some power line work. We were heading back to some towers from where we were. And the crewman, or the, sorry, the linesman, is always on the side of the machine because that's where they work from. So I was flying with Aaron Fitzgerald, who flies the Red Bull B0105, which most of you will know. And we thought, okay, let's see what it looks like from up above. Well, we positioned it around. We called radio down to Carlos, told him to look up, and that was a resulting shot. Again, unique angle, and that one would actually make a cool cover shot because, again, it's something different. It, it stands out. Um, let me got a couple more here. Okay. Most people would think that shooting the back end of a helicopter wouldn't actually look that nice. Well, this was one of Heliflight's AW139s as we were cruising up the Hudson River um, on the west side, I think it was, to turn around and come back down through New York City. Well, we thought, okay, let's see what different angles we can find. So we spent probably eight or nine minutes up, down, below, over the top, right underneath. And this angle actually works. Um, yes, you don't see the front side of it, but it's a whole different perspective. And when you're out there shooting, if you've got the time, shoot the heck out of it. You know, there's, as Mike and us were talking yesterday, we were talking about the value of imagery. Now, this one is a classic example of a VIP corporate helicopter. And getting these sort of things is what allows a company to promote their services to everyone else, helping them make money, et cetera. So the extra few minutes that you can get these sort of shots will make a big difference in the end when you actually present them to your clients. Now, I'll just get a couple more here. Okay. Again, this was on bushfires in Australia. Um, obviously, you're sort of you're limited there on what you can get, but the overhead shots for me have always been a personal favourite, especially with firefighting, because you when the aircraft drop their loads like Kestrel's two twelve here, which is up near Port Macquarie, um, you can get some amazing footage. The side on shot looks like just another helicopter dropping water. But the overhead shot, where you've got the, the power lines, oh, sorry, come here, yeah, sorry, the main road on that one running below adds that little bit of depth to it. And again, it goes back to the backgrounds and the subject matter and actually the lighting. So there's, there's actually so much you can do with angles of helicopters. Even, I'll just open this one. This is the last one on this segment. Looking back up at helicopters. Now, this was... The one you saw of the AW139 heading up the river, well, this was at sister ships as we were coming back down the other side of the river and they were back in formation with us. You're looking up, up at them this time. Again, another different angle. Um, we shot these ones looking down on them as they came down the parkway up the, the side of the river. Um, and again, it's just, there's so many different angles as both Lynn and Mike will, you know, attest to, that you could be shooting. It's when you send in a package of images to a publisher, 
give them a wide range because it also shows your versatility and that you're thinking outside the box. If Lynn sends in, say, a whole bunch of images like Mike showed, 20 different shots, people, different air-to-air -air angles, from the top, underneath, from the front, from the back, then the, the natural thing is, okay, this guy's thinking outside of the box, let's take a gamble, see what they do. If you're just sending in side-on shots and 20 of them are the same, it's like, oh yeah, that's nice, next, and then you move on. So always remember to do stuff that makes you stand out from everybody else. Now, do you, do you want to talk about the light stuff now, Dan? Actually, right at the moment, Ned, I think it's a good transition point to go to Lynn to talk about uh, live versus stage shots because oh. um, I think uh, some of the images you uh, had right there would be reflective of that too. So Lynn, do you want to talk about that real quick? Absolutely. Let me uh, jump over here. I'll share my screen. Let me know when you guys can uh, see the screen. Let's see, share. Got it. Okay. And I'm going to go ahead and use the uh, the PowerPoint that I used last time because it has some images on there that illustrate the actual point. And like um, Mike and Ned, I enjoy helicopters and SWAT people and guns. <laughs> As you can see here, I have many photos with uh, guys pointing guns. Um, but let's talk a little bit about staged versus live. So when you go out on some of these photo shoots, let me get to the, let me move this out of the way, here we go. When you go out on these photo shoots, there's gonna be times where you're trying to capture the essence of what the operator does. And sometimes you'll have to stage a shot because like, for example, in the law enforcement stories that all three of us were just uh, showing briefly there, it's very difficult to be with them at the time when a call occurs and capture that. So sometimes you have to stage shots. Same goes with say EMS operators. That's, that's probably the best example that I can give when you have to stage a shot because there's not enough room typically in an aircraft to go ride along with an operator on a call and actually get a patient being moved you know, into the helicopter from an ambulance or a rescue scene. So sometimes you have to stage shots. Um, I just wanna reiterate, and this basically falls right in line with what Mike and Ned were saying about the general um, approach to capturing images. Always safety. Will it convey what the, uh, uh, the operation does? That's Mike's big point. And then, of course, the human element. Mike was, was uh, hammering on that point just a little bit ago. We always like to see the people. Just the aircraft are really cool, but we love to see the individuals. And so let's talk about some stage shots. So I mentioned EMS operations. So this right here is a MedTrans operations at the University of Florida. They have, uh, it's an EC-155, very capable uh, center here in Gainesville. And this is actually in my hometown, so I didn't even have to travel to get this, but they wanted to show their capabilities with neonates. So here we go, we staged this shot. They've got a, uh, a mannequin baby inside, so you really can't see it. We had several different angles. So that's a good angle right there. So this is an example of a stage shot. Another one, Air Evac Life Team. We went uh, on location with them. We spent uh, three or four days. They wanted me to come up there and shoot a recruiting video for them. And um, at the same time, I went ahead and did a bunch of photography and we staged this scene call, which was very near the airport. We didn't have to go far. We had an ambulance. We did some shooting from the air as well as from the ground. So this is on the ground and this actually made the cover and it really, they wanted to highlight their, Bell, their new Bell 407 aircraft and their crews doing what they do. So these are, those are two good examples of stage shots. Now, sometimes you just go out and you fly with an operator and they do what they do and you just get as much as you can while you're doing it. Here's an example where I was uh, embedded with a, uh, a UH, I mean, not a UH, I was sitting in a UH-72 Lakota, but I was embedded with an Apache squadron we were in the Utah Proving Grounds where they were doing their Hellfire missiles and 2.75 rockets. They were on the range doing their annual recurrent training. And although this is a side-on shot, you know, it's kind of a standard side-on shot. My goal here was to try and get the rocket coming out of the helicopter. And I, I, I learned a lesson about shutter speed because the shutter speeds that we normally operate with 
to get the rotor blades to blur does not work when you have rockets coming, <laughs> coming out of the aircraft. So you have to give on the shutter speed um, to, to get those rockets. So that right there was a live shot. I was sitting with the doors open and my feet hanging out of a UH-72 Lakota while they were on the range firing. And I was, we were videoing, doing slow-mo 4K video as well as, um, as photography. And it took me, I can't tell you how many shots to get this exact one, maybe 200 just to get this exact one that I wanted. Another example, this was with the mosquito control operation up in Savannah, Georgia. And not only do they do mosquito control, they actually had a training drill going on where they use their aircraft. They have an agreement with the city where they use their aircraft to, um, if they have some of those river boats that go out the, the Savannah River, if one overturns and there's a bunch of people that fall in the river, they're required to respond and put rescue swimmers in the water and special gear um, quickly. So they happen to have a training drill going on with their local fire rescue department. So we were up flying around while they were doing their training. So this wasn't staged. They were actually jumping out of the aircraft and we were just getting what we could. And again, we shot video on this and as, as well as uh, photography. And this was live. I was embedded with an army operation in Northern California for a week, actually. And um, they were just there I was at sunset, they were moving some cargo from one location to another with a Black Hawk. And I know we're getting ready to talk about lighting and maybe this is a good segue into the lighting. This is just a perfectly backlit sunset shot. Uh, it shows exactly what the helicopter is doing. So keep that in mind when you go to a photo shoot is how many of these shots are gonna be live? And am I going to have to stage something to capture the essence of what they do? Because you do not wanna leave the operation without being able to capture that essence. And the last photo that I have, I think that's the last photo that I have. Um, this is with Tennessee Valley Authority. And this was on an actual job. They had entire crews working there. And this is just a unique photo uh, I didn't like that the blades didn't, didn't all match. That just happens sometimes. Um, but this is just a unique photo with the bucket trucks and the wires and the people and everybody working. And Ned was talking about getting that, that compelling, interesting angle. So the flip side of this is I was inside the actual aircraft while the guys were stepping off of the Tyler uh, step or Tyler bench rather you know, onto the top of the stanchions. And so that's a unique shot. That's what they're seeing. And I'm sitting there right next to the pilot while he's just sitting there hovering next to that. So um, staged versus live, you have to give consideration to both to do what Mike said, and that's capture the essence of the operation. Yeah, I think that is a great transition to, uh, to talk about lighting, uh, Lynn. I think that uh, those images, um, you know, you were using all available light now. And I noticed in a couple of cases on um, the cockpit, Mike had a flash, which makes sense because, uh, you know, trying to balance that interior exterior lighting um, is difficult sometimes. And so, Ned, I know you want to talk about uh, you shooting with available light. Uh, do you want to bring up your images on that one? Yeah, I, I thought I'd bring this up because 99% of the imagery that we see is like normal front lit, Everything looks all nice. It's a beautiful, fine day. Um, but there's actually a lot more. If you, if you actually look at the available light that you have some days, there's a lot more than what you think, and it can actually work to your advantage. Now, obviously, um, I'll open up this first one to give you... Yeah. Okay. Now, this one I shot in the... Uh, there's an island off the coast of Italy, and I was with a 407 operator who just got their, their new one, uh, Alley Company. And we were just coming back in. Uh, the sun was sort of starting to come down a little bit in the background. And I just thought, okay, let's go over the other side, because you can always, one thing to always keep in mind, exhaustive helicopters put out a heck of a lot of heat. And that can actually make for some really good images when you're shooting back in towards the sun and everything's backlit, as you can see here. Now, it, this, this sort of um, available light bit that we're talking about now is to encourage every photographer out there 
go out and put yourself in that uncomfortable area where you're shooting towards the sun or late in the afternoon, early in the morning, because you'll actually get some really, really stunning images out there. Now, obviously there's that one. I'll go to this next one. And Ned, one of the things I liked about that last photo is that you I find when I'm doing backlit photos, um, especially over the water, when the sun hits a certain angle, there's a point or an angle where the water almost looks like tinfoil. Yeah. And it, uh, and it really, it, uh, it really shows out in the bottom of the photo. So that's why I like what that photo is. It, it has that tinfoil effect. Yeah, and, and whenever I see that on a shoot, what I'll always do, obviously, and I presume you do the same, Mike, is when, if you see that happen and we've got the time, I'll always get them to do a couple of orbits. Yeah. And you can actually shoot that from the same angle and, mm -hmm. or sorry, from different angles, you know, same height, higher, looking down, and you can actually get some pretty cool, imagery from it yep now okay i'll just get to this next one okay sunset shots are always cool um obviously this one i shot in the middle east i was shooting stuff with the royal flight from dubai um we'd been out playing around over what they call the world um and we just thought okay sun's coming down let's mess around for another 15 20 minutes um Ooh. hank harrington who was a chief pilot there good friend said, yep, we've got the time. So we had, I uh, was shooting from 412. We had two AW139s and the AW189s. And we just thought, okay, let's play around with the sun. We got some absolutely stunning stuff out there. So if it's late in the afternoon and, and you know, you're heading back towards base or going out somewhere first in the morning for a shoot, take an extra few minutes and position the aircraft with the sun as a background. You can get some absolutely amazing shots out there. Now I'll go to this on on that one. I'll go. Now yeah, while, you, while you're bringing up that next shot, Ned, I'm going to point out that none of you guys shoot uh, on A on your camera settings, right? No, correct. No. <laughs> yeah, you're going to say something, Mike. Uh, so it's just talking about the um, about the the light, um, and I think that's one of the things is that everyone appreciates like the the golden hour you know, trying to get out in those times. So it's, that's, that's a critical thing is, you know, trying to get it either early morning or early evening um, and take advantage of that. But for me, I prefer the early evening. I find that you get uh, a little bit longer to shoot at those, uh, at those times. Yeah. And, and to be honest, the light's actually a lot softer as it's coming down. Cause when it comes up, it actually gets the, the golden hour is actually like the golden 20 minutes. Yeah. Because in most places, it'll come up and then it'll just take off up to the top. But when it's coming down, it seems to last a lot longer. Now, this one, I was at Kandahar Air Base in Afghanistan, just standing out there one evening after we'd come back from somewhere else. This uh, pave hawk was coming back in from a mission and the sun setting over in the backdrop. You know, it's one of those, yep, I could have just packed up all my stuff, gone inside, but stuck around on the ramp for 10, 15 minutes and got this and a whole bunch of Chinooks and other aircraft. But again, the sunset actually, you know, it gives you a whole different look to images rather than that had just been a, you know, front lit aircraft. It would be just another Black Hawk landing in, in a location. Well, and that uh, brown dust of Kandahar is well known. It gives yeah. beautiful sunsets, but uh, yeah, that's again where you do not want to change the lenses outside. No, exactly. Now, this, this one um, was actually, this was about oh, two o'clock in the afternoon, actually. And this was on a bushfire 2019-2020 season, flying with the air attacks. We were outside of a place called Glen Innes in New South Wales. And Chili, his nickname, who was flying this, had been bucketing out of a location to the fire ground. The smoke was as thick as anything. That's why two o'clock in the afternoon, you've got this sort of view. Um, you know, he, he was great to work with, said, hey, Chili, do you mind just hovering there for 30 seconds to give me a chance to get a shot? Um, in the camera ship, you know, forward, back, up, down, left, right, took about 100 shots in the space of about three minutes because he, he stayed a little bit longer than 30 seconds. Um, and again, it gives you a whole different aspect of, you know, what could be a boring shot otherwise 
And again, it's just playing with that available light that we had that day. Now, talking about first thing in the morning, as what Mike was saying, you actually can get some decent shots. This was doing some ag work, literally 10 miles down the road here in New Zealand. The sun hadn't quite peaked up over the horizon yet. I think it was about 5.30 in the morning. And it was um, one of Oceania Aviation's long ranges out doing some top dressing. But as you can see, that early morning, the late afternoon, you can get some really, really nice light. Um, and what a lot of people don't realize is at night, um, where is it, this one here, the available light is actually a lot more than you think. This one here was a time exposure I did on the heli Sunset Boulevard helipad of Angel City Air slash Welk Aviation. We were there doing some other stuff. I was flying with Aaron Fitzgerald and I said, you know, hey, that's cool looking background. Let's just quickly get a couple of shots. That's LA in the background. Looking at it, when we were standing there, it just looked okay. But doing the time exposures, it brings out the whole background. You can see on the right-hand side, that trail is a jet going into LAX. You can see the moon coming up. Playing around with those time exposures, again, if you've got the time, adds another whole dimension, um, especially when you've got like, you know, clouds, stars. Um, I've seen some amazing stuff from some Air Force photographers down in Africa where the whole night is just full of stars and the pave hawks that they photographed just looked absolutely stunning. So it's again, push yourself out of your comfort zone and play in those areas that you normally wouldn't and see what you can get. Like this one here is, this was about 10 o'clock at night. The only lighting we had was a little tower on the right of the image. Um, I was out working with the NZ Army Special Forces, the SAS and three squadron. And again, got the guys, guys to turn on the tip lights, which you can see all that's the big green arc around them. And I think it was about a 10 second exposure, five second exposure for these. But again, you're playing, the light is there. You just have to work with it and play around with it. You know, it's, it's all trial and error. You might shoot 50 shots to get two sharp ones. Now, the last one I'll show you is, uh, this one, and this is one I absolutely love shooting in the mountains because you get this late afternoon light. This was this mountain flyers a few years ago, and you look at all the texture on the side of the the ice and into the cave where the sun's shining in. You've got your dark patches, your light patches, the sun on the side of the machine, and there's you know it's it is amazing what you can get if you look for it. If you don't look, you can't see it. So again, I, I encourage everyone out there, push yourself out of your comfort zone, go and try something new. What, you know, what's gonna happen? You're gonna fail or you succeed. If you fail, try again, try something else, but at least give it a shot to come up with some amazing images. And over to you, Dan. Okay, well, let's, um, before we get into the, uh, the meat and potatoes of the discussion, we've got some questions that came in that I think are relevant. And I want to jump into them. Um, let's start with uh, one from uh, Roloff John. Um, how do you convince the, uh, a unit that you need air-to-air -air photos for your article? Um, this is often very difficult to achieve as a citizen, especially in military organizations. It's quite common. Um, how do you get accredited? How do you open the door uh, to get shots for military or say even uh, law enforcement units. Uh, Lynn, let's go with you first on this. Yeah, that's, that can be a chicken or egg thing. Actually, I would say if you're brand new and you're trying to make an inroads into an operation to get some experience, that therein lies a challenge. Sometimes you have to know someone to be able to do it. Um, if you, have some experience under your belt and you're approaching um, one of us to do a story on a specific operator, then you can make that pitch to us. Of course, we have to see some of your previous work, right? 
And then you can go to the operator and say, hey, I'd like to do a story for you or on you rather, or your operation for Rotocraft Pro or Heliops or Vertical Magazine. Um, very often when that occurs, the doors will open. I, I haven't, I, I can't recall anyone in, in a very long time where they haven't said, I'd like to do a story, it's gonna be in Rotocraft Pro. And they're like, no, we don't wanna do that. So I understand the challenge when you're brand new, maybe Ned or Mike can shed a little light on getting that initial experience because we're obviously not gonna hang our brands and take a risk on someone that's not proven. We don't have the time for that, um, unfortunately. Um, unless I, I have on one occasion, um, I was going to a fly-in. It, it was a local fly-in in Florida and there was gonna be 10 or 15 helicopters. And there was a, a photographer that said, Lynn, I'm interested in doing helicopter industry journalism could um, I take some photos? And I happen to be going there. So I said, you know what? Why don't we get together and tag along for the entire day? And let's take photos together because I was covering it. And then I can give you some pointers and we can just share some experience. So I've done that before. And that is another way, I guess, is if you know a photographer and they're willing to do a little handholding maybe they can uh, help you gain some experience as well. Maybe Mike or Ned can shed a little more light on that. Yeah, I, well, I think that with, oh, you got Mike. I was gonna say, Ned, I'm gonna jump in because I, oh. I was gonna come to you next because one of the images you showed um, when you were talking about the corporate aircraft in New York, and we talked a little bit about this yesterday in our planning meeting, was educating others on the value of getting images you know, of, of a company's aircraft. And so maybe that's something you can also address there. Yeah, well, what every photographer or photojournalist needs to realize out there, and Mike and Lynn will agree with me on this, is you have a key role in convincing the people that you're working with the, the benefits of them spending 500 bucks, 5,000. Hell, I've been on shoots where we've been in excess of 100 grand to, to capture images. Of the benefits to them on capturing great imagery from marketing for social media, which probably I'd say 80% of helicopter operators out there now are part of. Um, you explain to them why having a feature in Heliops or Vertical or Rotocraft Pro or Rota benefits them. That readership, if you're like a VIP operator, for example, like Heliflight, who I've worked with for probably 15 years, every time they get a new machine, we'll go back and shoot it. And that's so they, their audience, you'd be surprised, a lot of them actually read our various publications because the chief pilots, the director of aviation, um, a lot of these companies like Merck and others that have VIP aircraft, um, I know for a fact that some of them actually have our magazines, all three of them on their iPads in the back of the machines. So what you're doing is helping increase that company's um, exposure and not so much credibility, but letting people know they're out there. So it's up to the photographer and the journalist to show them the benefits of why they need the imagery done. And once most of them see it, oh, yep, yeah, okay, the light bulb goes on and they're more than happy to oblige. Your thoughts, Mike? So actually, if we can just step back one with the with the first question there, Dan, we were talking about trying how you know how do you get access to it to unit, and then I'll come back to the value of photography. Um, so one of the things is that um, when I'm looking at you know considering a new a new photographer that's coming on, I'll look at what they've already shot. It might not be air to air, but you're looking at you know stuff they've they've uh, they've shot from the ground. Um, it might have been stuff that they were shooting from in an aircraft, but actually not an air to air or things like that. Um, and then they'll pitch you on an idea that it might be, it might be a, a military exercise that they're going on. So once we've given them that, um, the go ahead to go do that story, um, you know, then they can use our name. So now it's a, it's like a name drop. Okay. This is going to be for vertical. This is for Heliops. This is for Rotocraft Pro. Um, and then that, and then what I ask them to do is to show like content. 
So show a story that we already published to, that illustrates that, hey, look at they went and did air to air photography. This is the this is the sort of support that they had for these uh, for these photos. The other part is that you have to explain to them is that the priority of of them being part of that mission is a they're they're going to be in the background. Um, B, they are not the priority. The priority is the mission or the training that's that's taking place. And what you're asking is that, you know, can I be part of that as you're doing it? I'm not looking for um, for exclusivity as far as, hey, I need to go for, for a half hour, 45 minutes to go do an air to air shoot. So there are certain things that you can do that will help get your foot in the door um, with uh, if it's the military. And then once you're able to demonstrate that, hey, this is what I was able to do. Um, my last visit and now they'll be able to they'll be willing to maybe take that time one of the things i will caution all photographers on and this has happened to me probably on three different occasions where a photographer has gone on uh, has approached an operator approached a military and did a name drop and said i am doing this for vertical magazine without our prior consent that will get you nowhere and you'll never ever submit photos to vertical magazine we've had we've had this happen on three different occasions so it's a very small industry and then people will come back to us and say hey you know so and so they just they message us they said they're shooting for you and we have no idea um so that's on on the one side just with the um you know how try to gain access the other side is i want to talk about with with the value of photography is that there's a lot that goes into these photos so ned already alluded to the costs of the helicopters themselves so these are very expensive aircraft to fly. They're, they're much more expensive to fly than fixed wing aircraft. So that's one part of the equation. The other part of the equation is that it costs us or any other photographer a lot of money to get there. Uh, I live in Canada, uh, Lynn, you're down in Florida, Ned, you're down in New Zealand. So when we're going around the world and Ned probably more than any of us travels to all different corners of the world, that costs you a lot of money to get there. You have your hotel costs, now we haven't even touched on your camera costs. So between us, we probably each have about anywhere from 20 to 30 plus thousand dollars worth of camera equipment. So you have that cost that you have to add in there. If you're doing it right, you have your insurance costs. What's that, what's that um, factoring in? Plus you also have our expertise. So when we're able to get these aircraft to fly, there's all sorts of costs that you have to take in consideration. So there is nothing um, worse that happens is that when someone says, can I use your photo for a marketing piece and I'll give you a photo credit? Well, how does that pay the bills? So it's trying to understand that it's not a matter of us sitting in the back of a helicopter and going click. It's a matter of sitting in the back of a helicopter, using our expertise, keeping it safe, um, being able to um, show the right image as far as uh, projecting the right image for a helicopter operator, or if it's say for an engine manufacturer, someone who's making a cargo hook or a Bambi bucket or whatever. So there's a value that we bring to that. And I think that's one of the, the, the hardest things in aviation photography is how do you um, make people to understand that it's not just a photo. There's more that goes along, uh, along with it. And that's a constant challenge. Um, I, I see some of the people's names on here. I see Mark Many on here, and I'm sure Mark's going to put his name up or put his hand up here in a minute and say, yeah, this is exactly one of the issues we deal with. Um, I was explaining to you yesterday, if I took normal uh, commercial photography rates, and I'm talking non-aviation, um, to do anything that was aviation related, you got to discount them by anywhere from, from 50 to 75% to get it to a number that people will accept it in aviation. So even though we're, we're in an industry where it's inherently expensive, um, it's still trying that game of trying to understand, make people understand the value of those photos that you are getting, especially some of the exclusivity that we get as well. Um, Ned's demonstrated many times where, where he's on fires, he's able to do stuff in New Zealand on fires that we can't do up here in North America to get some of that access. Um, so there's a value that comes with that where Ned's able to capture you know, a Chinook on fires, an H-125 on fires that, you know, a marketing, it, it could be Airbus helicopters, it could be Bambi or, or a number of companies that say, yeah, I want that image, but they want that image because they're trying to sell a product. So they're trying to make money off of your image. So, so I think that's an important thing is that it's just understanding the value of, of what we're doing is not just sitting there and going click. No, so, I, yeah, exactly. Well said. 
Um, I'm going to have to jump through. We're, we're down to about a half an hour before we uh, got a hard stop. So um, William said, uh, do all shoots have to include air to air? I'm a mechanic and I use my niche to focus on the maintenance side and uh, what owners and operators don't normally see. Is this a good niche? I, I would uh, say, yeah, because the, the maintainers, the engineers, the mechanics, without them, nothing happens. And as photographers, and we will go on a shoot, we go to the, an operator, we get out in the helicopter, we go flying, we come back, we leave. But the me main mechanics and everything, they're working long after we've been there. They've probably been up hours and hours before we even get there. So if we're doing a dawn photo shoot, they would have either worked till maybe, you know, 10, 11 o'clock at night, prepping all the machines. When we get back, we just bang, we're gone. And they there, wheel the machine inside, you know, go over it, get it ready for the next flight or carry on their maintenance. So yeah, I, I actually think it's an area that we actually, putting my hand up, I say we do overlook it quite a lot. And so uh, Lynn and Mike, I would imagine you would agree with that? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And I think it's a good niche too, because um, when you look through the magazines, and you look at the advertisers in the magazines, you'll see a lot of MRO operations um, and operations that are relative to maintenance. So they're spending advertising dollars. So you know that they're also reading the publications and they see value in uh, maintenance features. I know that we try to, in our six, we do six issues a year, we try to have maintenance related features on an MRO or something along those lines, at least four times. And we have a we have a per issue column called maintenance minutes. So we try to focus on that. So that is a good niche. And I'm sure that Mike and Ned both have a need for that type of content. Even if it's not a feature, it might uh, uh, accompany other articles, I would imagine too. Yeah, that's a big that's a big thing. It helps to illustrate other other stories that would relate with if you're talking about MRO that not in generalization, not one specific company. But I think um, one of the for for William for that um, for that question, the thing that I like about that, in and this is one of the things I talked about before, is it's different, and that's how you're going to separate yourself from everyone else is that it's different. So focusing on that maintenance side, I think all of us will scramble to uh, to reach out to William when we're done here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. well, and then. I, I actually had a little sticky note um, when we were talking about the different uh, things. Um, and S Stefan asked the same question. People shots are great. Don't you have to have a model release, a waiver form um, from each of the people that uh, you're shooting? Um, Mike, you want to start with that one? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer that it's, it's varied. It depends who you're shooting with. Um, some, I would say 99% of the people I'm I'm shooting with it, it's just they're all casual like I'll ask me you want to sign the, the model release no I, uh, if you're shooting if I'm doing a shoot that's say for a contract shoot for any of the helicopter manufacturers absolutely so if we're shooting for for Airbus or Bell or whatever then we will get modeling releases um, but I haven't done them for to be honest we haven't done them on the magazine side Lynn uh, Ned do you guys use model releases no again like Mike said unless I'm shooting for like an, an Airbus or a Bell or, and it's for a proper setup photo shoot. Um, no, it's just, I suppose the attitude, not the attitude, but it's all the images are in a sort of a public place. Anyone could see it. So it's, it's not, it doesn't really come under having a model release. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. Yeah, we, we have a model release. However, we rarely ever need to use it. Most of these operations, the people that you're shooting are employees of the operation that you're shooting. And as an employee, the companies generally have a policy that says, if we want you to be in a photo, you're going to be in a photo. Of course, they can choose not to, rather, but they're, but they're covered underneath that. So it just depends, but I'm, I'm like Mike, like 98% of the time, we don't do it. Okay, uh, John asked a question we got quite a lot of um, from the previous webinar. I don't think we really got it. Um, he's asking about 
where you would normally start with shutter speeds and apertures, maybe an ISO, um, just as a starting point uh, when you're when you're getting ready to shoot a job during daytime operations. And then, uh, you know, what, what kind of depth of field are you looking for? What kind of rotor blur are you looking for with the shutter speeds? I, I get, well, I'll start this one, Dan, as far as um, for myself, um, <clears throat> A lot of it's going to depend on how windy it is that day too. Like when I'm looking at some of the camera settings, you know, am I, if I'm in another helicopter, is it bumpy? Um, and that'll dictate where, where I'm at. And typically I'm with shutter priority. Um, so, you know, the sweet spot for me, you know, let's say it's one sixtieth, that's where you're going to be safe. But then once you have your, your images and you're, you're happy with what you have, then that's how you start to bring the shutter down where now you're one twenty fifth, or now you're going down to, you know, if you want to get a full disc, you'll be down at, at a, a 20th or a 10th um, to get those shots. So for me, it's always shutter priority. Um, ISO, depending on the day, um, typically I'm going to be anywhere from that 100 to 400. Um, even if I'm, when I'm getting into nighttime, um, if I'm using a tripod or, or some other stabilized mount, when I say stabilized mount, I'm not talking about a gimbal, but something I'm just keeping that camera perfectly stable. I'll still keep it at 400, but if I need to, then I, you know, I'll bump it up as high as say two or 3000 um, ISO, just depending on what that nighttime uh, photo is. Or I just did re recently did a shoot with Orange in Toronto and it was uh, with crew with night vision goggles. And uh, I was having a problem with the tripod and it was handheld shooting at night with them on goggles, but I was at uh, 1500 ISO and was able to capture the, uh, capture the shot. Um, so for me, like depth of field and things like that, to be honest with you, um, a lot of times when you're doing your air to air photography, time is of the essence and you don't really have time to sit there and start fiddling with settings. So I'm going to go to, this is what I, what I'm going to is my shutter priority. That for me, that's, that's my priority. Lynn, what about you? I am almost identical. I typically would start out around 125th and I would bracket between 60th and I might even go all the way up to 250. It just depends. And Mike's probably thinking 250. Who would ever go to 250? But sometimes I'll go up that high. And, and he made it, Mike. Yeah, Mike. Um, he made a really good point about the environment that you're in. If it's windy out and you're shaking like this, then you're going to have to have a higher shutter speed, right? If you are in a Robinson R44, you may have to have a higher shutter speed. If you're in an MD500, um, then you can probably take it low on a nice calm day when it's as smooth as glass and you can, you know, bump it on down. But I'm usually bracketing somewhere between the 60th and 250, depending on the aircraft and the wind. Shutter priority is where I'm at. Um, I hardly ever shoot on manual in air to air operations. I may, I shoot on manual a lot for stage shots on the ground and people shots and things of that nature. Um, and then as far as aperture goes, most of the time I'm taking what I, what I get, you know, out of the shutter priority. But if I am really conscious of the background, say, you know, for example, I'll just share the screen real quick. Say for example, this shot here. So this shot was two aircraft. I wanted to do, um, this was with Maverick uh, in the Valley of Fire. And we, we were using one aircraft as the photo aircraft and the other one as the subject. And I was like, boy, I'd really like to have two aircraft in one shot. How can I do that? Can you drop me on that cliff down there? Yeah, absolutely. Dump me on the cliff down there. But this background was very unique and I wanted to have some of that in focus. I wanted to see the texture of it. So if I'd have been shooting at F2.8, you know, then I would have had a really very blurry background and it would have looked kind of cool, but I wouldn't have captured that, that stuff in the background. So I was shooting you know, much higher on the f-stops. I don't even know what it was. It could have been 13 or something like that. But but I consciously went higher on the f-stop to get that background. So it just depends on what you're trying to do. But mostly I'm like my shutter priority and uh, take what you get on the aperture. Perfect. Um, Ned, what about you real quick? Uh, you know, can't really add much more than what the guys have said. Um, I'll always, my one pet hate with um, helicopter images is stopped rotor blades. And, you know, from time to time, and I guarantee Mike's in the same position, we'll get someone to email us a photo with the braids absolutely frozen. It's like, oh, cool. What do you think of this fantastic shot? 
<laughs> and you sort of have to bite your tongue on what you're going to reply. Um, but then you just try to, you know, give them some constructive criticism, I think is the right word, about how you, you know, the ideal thing is to have nice, good rotor blur. So I'm always shooting as low as I can get away with. Um, except the only one thing you have to remember on that is sometimes if you're above the other aircraft and you're shooting at 25th, 30th of a second um, and you get a full disc, you can actually, um, oh, you don't get to see as clearly the fuselage or whatever is the aircraft below. So sometimes there's actually that compromise on having a great disc and sacrificing the fuselage or whatever is under the disc for that, or you, you know, hike the speed up a little bit, you get a good little arc, but then you can still see, you know, the detail below. Uh, Lynn brought up a photo a few minutes ago uh, where he got off on the cliff. And I know one of the things we talked about yesterday uh, during planning was a single ship. Mike, you want to start with uh, talking about single ship? Yeah, and I think this is a, a couple of the questions that came up, and it actually even goes back to an earlier question about, you know, how do you how do you fly um, to go with some of the operations? And and one of the things that I wanted to demonstrate quickly or show quickly is that um, not all times you have to you don't need two helicopters to accomplish what you're what you're after. Um, sometimes I know that all all of us run into the problem where you show up and there's supposed to be two helicopters or three helicopters and only one serviceable. So what you try to do is you try to make the best out of it um, and come away with something. So the this, the sequence of images that I'm going to uh, I'm going to show you here, um, these are all all these shots are not air to air. So can you see these here now, Dan? Yes. Okay. So these are not air to air photos. So what we were able to do in uh, in this case is I was dropped off on a mountain at. Uh, 4,500 feet. Um, so this is off of uh, Vancouver Island on British Columbia in, uh, in Canada. And uh, so the crew dropped me off at, at 4,500 feet. And um, I can tell you that when they departed, it was interesting because that's a big helicopter to be under that rotor wash. But, um, and this was, I had a search and rescue technician beside me with a radio. So we were directing them as far as these are the types of the images that we wanted. So this is all these images, it was either standing on a cliff or again, getting those interior shots with one helicopter. In this case, I jumped on the hoist with the, uh, with a SAR tech to be able to, again, illustrate everything that they do. This is from the ground. Uh, we found a, a waterfall of opportunity to do a shot. Again, we only have one helicopter. Um, we basically had them go through and do a SAR scenario um, with the SAR techs. But again, I only had one aircraft. So how are you able to do everything that you want to do with only one aircraft? Make it look air to air. So here's a good example of a shot at a 20th of a second. Um, they were only flying at us probably at about 30 knots. Um, which really helps. So you can get that rotor blur. You can notice the waterfall, uh, the small waterfall in the background, how that's blurred. Uh, again, shot taken from the ground. Um, here's a shot, the same mountain where I took that, that head-on photo of the cormorant. Um, I had them fly a 360 around me, and this is what was behind me. So I was able to get full sun on the front, and then on the back, then I was able to get the silhouette and be able to show, show the mountains. Have them do a couple of flybys. Um, Again, and, and it's kind of deceiving because when you look at this photo, it looks like I'm standing right on the edge of the cliff and I'm not. I'm probably about a good 50 feet back. Uh, and again, talking with the crew, they're probably doing a flyby. At, uh, this was probably about a 60 knot um, flyby as they went by. Um, here's a situation where I had to pump up the shutter speed a little bit because we had the speed. We had a higher wind because we're standing on top of the mountain. So make sure that you had a sharp image. Um, but anyone else, they would think it's an air to air photo. This is where we got, uh, this is the area that we got dropped off with the, uh, with the helicopter. Um, so it's a good, I just wanted to, to, to show that you don't always need to have the two helicopters. You can make it work. You can make it look air to air and you can still accomplish everything that you need to accomplish. Okay. I, I, I want to jump in. Uh, I'd, I'd like to continue with uh, Lynn and uh, Ned, but I, I think we also have to move on. I want to get to the one question I think is most important to everybody who's watching. Um, everybody's now paid attention. They know, you know, what kind of images you're looking for. They're taking your tips on how to shoot. How do they, um, how do people get work from each of you? Um, how, how do they get, how do photographers get on your radar? So Lynn, let's start with you on that one. Um, 
Yeah, good question, Dan. So I think to begin with, you're, it's gonna be a reach out. You're initially gonna reach out. And the thing that we wanna see right away is the samples of your work. Show us something that you've actually done. Preferably in the helicopter industry, I guess there could be um, you know, someone doing fixed wing photography and then, and then transition over. I know Mike has a fixed wing magazine, so he may be able to see the contrast and comparison there. I, I don't know that I can necessarily do that. I need to see some helicopter imagery. Um, and then also the next big question. So let's say your imagery is really good. Recently, um, I started working with a, a, a new photographer and he reached out and he sent me, I think it was 24 images. And I would say probably a third of them were kind of similar in nature. And then the remainder of them were operational and unique. So I saw that, that hey, there's a little bit of talent there. So I reached out back out to the person. I said, hey, this stuff looks really good. He told me what the operation was, told me what they did, the, the photography matched. And so I asked him, the next, next question I asked him is, do you do anything other than photography? Do you do video? Do you do writing? So what other skills do you, do you bring to the table? I think that in, in my mind, I would give priority over somebody that can provide me photography and videography if I had a choice. If they come to, come to the table and said, hey, I can do a photo shoot and a video shoot, and the video can be either A, uh, edited in a format that matches the story, so you might have interviews and things of that nature. Um, I, we now have six people in our stable that can actually do photography, videography, and writing as well, can actually write a story. Now, sometimes the story, the writing may be the weakest link, but that's what we have copy editors for and we can actually massage that. But we can't do that to the photography and the video. So that's the actual priority there. So the other type of videography is social media. So if you can't edit a nice, clean, neat looking video that matches the story, can you provide me with um, five or six social media clips or shorts, things of that nature that have some music to them, something that's unique and interesting, maybe with jump cuts or something along those lines. So I would say the reach out is the first thing, show us your work, but also consider what other skills you have that we need. And we all need writing and videography as well. And if you can combine the three, we're talking, we're talking about it. Okay, Ned, what about you? Um, I, yeah, a, a lot of what Lynn said, um, send, us, send us an email with a selection of images, show us what, you know, you, your best of your best. There's no point, in you sending us a photo of through a fence of a a star sitting on the other side late in the afternoon um, because we are going to make a decision on whether we want to you know work with you based on what you sent us so send us the best of the best not not a couple of average images so to speak now as mike will also back me up on this to the the days of sending or in most cases, a photographer and a journalist on an assignment is gone away. A, a lot of the, the next generation that are coming through both take photos, write, and usually can start to do good video work. One, one of our guys, Jimmy Van Drunen, who we've started working with and is on our team based in the Netherlands, he'd never done video stuff before. We sent him off to Scandinavia to do a bit, and he said, oh, I was playing around with um, some video work. He had actually hung out with, I think, Lloyd Horgan previously, got some tips from what Lloyd did, and what he came up with was fantastic. And that's the type of person that is going to, when, when Mike or I or Lynn look at them, okay, we're looking, we don't want someone just, okay, well, we're going to use you for next issue, then bye-bye. We're looking long-term. How lot, you know, is this person got the skills, the attributes, the writing ability that we can work with going forward? And that if we send them on a shoot from like Canada to Sweden, from New Zealand to South Africa, we know they're going to deliver the goods, put a good story together, know the questions to ask. As Lynn referred to, when you've got good copy editors, or we call them sub editors here. We've got a fantastic one that can knock anything into shape. As long as the information is there, he will knock it into shape. 
it goes to print, then the person that submit it can look at it and go, oh, okay, yep, I see what they've done to it. This is what I need to do. And it's always the, the way you've got to look at it with all, not just our magazines, but any magazine, it's always a learning experience. I guarantee you, I'm still learning stuff now that I never knew before. Mike's probably in the same boat. Lynn's in the same boat. Um, so when you contact someone, offer them the package if you can do it. If you've never done writing before, give it a shot. What have you got to lose? If you've never done videography before, give it a shot. You know, the, the, the new iPhones like Mike uses and what I've got, you can shoot some great video on it. And you'd be surprised um, at the quality of imagery you can get off an iPhone, especially the new ones now. So, you know what? Give it a shot, put your best foot forward and go from there. Okay, Mike, what about you? So basically I echo what, um, what Lynn and, uh, and Ned said. Um, and I go back to what I said earlier, you know, you have to be different. You know, that's what's going to get our attention. You have to be different. Um, a couple of the other things that they didn't touch on is one, you have to be easy to work with. And two, when I send you out, if we send you out on the first one, I am going to follow up with that operator to find out what you were like to work with. So, you know, were you easy to get along with? Were you demanding? Um, did you understand how to operate in and around helicopters? Um, you know, that's a big thing for us is that that's our reputation that you're putting out there. You were there to represent us. So we want to make sure that, hey, you know what, that person, they were great to deal with. You know, we had a lot of fun with them. Um, that's what you want to hear. I have had one where it did not go well and they never, and then that, that relationship ended pretty quick. Um, so you always have to be cognizant of those things that when you go out there, you're, it's not only yourself that you're representing, but you're representing a brand. And, you know, for all three of us, um, you know, it's taken years to, to get the brands to that sort of reputation that you have. So we're going to be very choosy I mean, you get our attention with being a different shot. And then it's just, you know, the personality that's behind that. And I think that's, that's a big thing. It's a, it all kind of morphs together. Okay. Well, I'm going to get to our wrap up question in just a second. We did have one come in through the chat session from uh, Ron. And I think I know the answer to this already, but I think uh, we can get a quick answer from each of you. Uh, what he's asking about is um, whether it's acceptable to Photoshop a helicopter into a different background. Uh, Ned, what do you? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. That to me, that's an absolute no, no. Um, my philosophy and basically hard, hard and fast rule is whatever image you see in Heliops, if you are reading the magazine, you could be standing right beside me the day that I took that photo and see exactly the same thing. It's, yeah, it's to, to me, I just, I won't have Photoshopped images. To me, it's, it's not real as such. Mike? I agree 100%. The only thing that I like to see Photoshopped is like, it's, it might be that we got to do slight color change, like minor stuff. But when you're changing backdrops, Absolutely not. No, that's uh, and what you'll find too with with helicopters because of the rotor blades versus say if you're if it's a jet, you know it's very rare you get a really good crop to change that backdrop, and it just makes it look worse. But no, we're uh, that's a hard no for us. Lynn, yeah, I would absolutely agree on the Photoshop front. The 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 most common times that we use Photoshop and it's needed is if we're trying to change the design element and look of a story and we're trying to either make it look desaturated or black and white or something along those lines. Or I've actually taken some really cool photos only to have a trash can that I didn't see sitting in the photo somewhere or some something that throws the photo off and we might clone stamp it out you know, something odd, a box was left on the ground and it just kind of detracts from what would be an other, otherwise good image. So that'd be the only two times that we would Photoshop, but, but we don't extricate the helicopter in the new environments. Okay, I will say that Rotor Magazine um, for our HAI's publication, we just finished our photo contest for the year. We do have a category for digitally enhanced photos, but we are very specific that that's what we want because we do know that there are people who can get very artistic results. And that is the only time that we at a rotor would do the same thing. Um, you know, is if you're looking for an artistic shot, uh, an illustrative shot, but um, we are very clear when something like that occurs. 
Uh, let's go with the wrap up question, guys. Uh, we've all been flying for years. We've been working in this industry for a long time. What's, what's been your oh crap moment? Uh, pardon, uh, I changed the language a little bit there. Um, what, what moment uh, in your photography career caused you to uh, really sit up and take notice? Uh, Mike, let's go with you first. Um, so I've only had one oh crap moment. Um, one of the things that we were talking about in, the, in our um, uh, webinar that we did previously was, you know, a safety aspect. So when you're up taking photos, you're also another set of eyes for the crew in that aircraft. So when you're not camera in hand and you're, and you're shooting that other helicopter, you're always looking around to see where the machine is. You know, if, if they've pulled away, they're doing a 360 or something, you're, you're always reminding people, hey, he's at your three o'clock at, uh, at, at half a kilometer, whatever it is. Um, it was actually not long after we started Vertical. Vertical's 20 years uh, next year. And um, it was a shoot down in the, the Gulf of Mexico. And this is literally the only time where I had that, uh, this situation happen. And uh, we were flying along and I asked the question, had they done formation before? The former military guys, um, they, they both had come back and said, yes, they had. Um, the, the mistake I made is I should have asked, you know, how many years since you had flown formation. Um, and we were doing the photo shoot and the photo shoot was going well, but I noticed on one occasion where we're flying along and we're flying as lead. So when you're flying as lead, when you're flying that formation, the whole purpose is you not to run into lead. That you, That is lead. There's a reason why he is lead. Um, <clears throat> and when I looked over, the pilot and his passenger were looking at each other talking. So I said to our pilot, can you please tell them to pay attention to they're flying in a formation? So he went back and he told them this and there was a passenger in the back with me and I just looked at him for a second to say something, whatever it was, and I look over and the helicopter is, is um, coming up underneath us at a very fast rate um, to the point that myself and the passenger started yelling at our pilot to, uh, to pull away and we were actually standing on the seat of, of, uh, of the helicopter. Um, it was happening that fast. So that's one of the things that, you know, these old crap moments is that when you're flying formation, you're doing shooting, things happen very, very quickly. And that for me 20 years ago was that you always have to pay attention. Even me looking for, it was like five seconds. And I thought he, you know, he was at a safe distance and to look over and see him coming and no one saw him coming at us. Um, the pilot had instructed him to, to pay attention and he went back to having that conversation with his passenger again. So that was my old, uh, old crap moment. And I'll tell you right after that happened, um, we landed immediately and, uh, I'm sure some can guess what happened to that pilot. The, uh, the one that was not paying attention. Um, but that certainly made you rethink, um, things, you know, how you approach these photo shoots and, and really paying attention to what's going around, going on around you at all times. Lynn, uh, what's, what was your moment? So I was in a third world country with some first world tourist areas. And, what, what, and we Florida? were, yeah, <laughs> we were set up to shoot along a beautiful coastline. Um, and I wanted a specific shot where the aircraft was coming at our aircraft. So imagine I'm sitting in the front left seat of an R66 right here. The pilot is sitting right next to me. I'm doing photography from the front seat. I got a videographer in the back seat with his camera bag. We're kind of heavy. And we've got a left quartering tailwind, all right? I know this is not the best situation um, to be in to shoot. However, I knew the aircraft, I knew the pilot experience was fairly low and we only had to be there for a very short period of time and we were at 500 feet and all I wanted was that aircraft flying up this beautiful long blue rocky coast and so I asked the pilot to gently ease in as like do you think we can handle this quarterly uh, tailwind I knew what the power margin was we were going to be hovering OGE he had maybe five to seven percent left on the torque as we rolled into this nice gentle hover we were just going to test it and if we couldn't maintain it because you know when you get tailwind it gets squirrely and uh so i but it was a pretty steady steady breeze not too heavy and um so we get into the hover it's really nice we're sitting there we're doing good i'm shooting everything looks good 
where we got about a six, 7% power margin. And he, we get a little burble of air and he applies some rapid pedal, which makes his torque increase to the 100%. When he sees that, all he wants to do is reduce the collective. So he reduces the collective, we start sinking, right? We got a tailwind, just a, just a nice little tailwind. We start sinking and then we're settling with power because we're settling into our own downwash. Now we were nice and high, so we had a lot of room. It was flat ground, we could get out of it. Um, but that little bit of overreaction and I actually, we started settling with power and I started talking on the microphone and the audience may not know, I'm a 30 year helicopter pilot with about 6,000 hours. Plenty of time in Robinson's. And in this case, I was told the pilot was, was fairly low time. He had about 700 hours. I asked him to leave the pedals in and the collective, but I didn't care if the cyclic was in because the Robinson has the T-bar. And I said, um, let's go ahead and push forward. Let's gain some airspeed, push forward, gain some airspeed. I started talking through it. He wasn't reacting. I actually had to take the center cyclic and push the aircraft forward for us to actually fly out of it cleanly. And so that was, there we were in settling with power. Ned, what about you? Um, oh, obviously I've been doing this a little bit longer than some of the guys. Um, not saying I'm older or anything. So I've said I had a few, uh, few more of those moments. Um, couple that come to mind, um, we chatted about this yesterday with, and it, this actually highlights the, the uh, spectrum of, you know, it can happen at, at any sort of experience level. We were doing a photo shoot in the Gulf of Mexico in a formation shoot. And the similar to what Mike had happened, we were actually in a turn and the aircraft that we were shooting, the pilot didn't have sight of them because he was focusing on his turn. He came in from about our four o'clock, five o'clock position and just kept coming and coming and coming. Um, one of the things that I always brief with my pilots is, okay, if I tell you to slide left, I mean, okay, there's a little bit of an issue, just be prepared to move out a little bit. If I say break left, then things are turning to crap and let's get the heck out of there. Well, where this aircraft was coming in, um, he started to slow down, but not enough. So it was like, Okay, break left. And as soon as I said that, our camera ship guy was out of there. Like half a second later, that aircraft was in that same piece of sky where we were. Now, this was a, I think he was about, again, seven, 800 hour pilot. Um, after that, we had a chat about, you know, closing speeds, et cetera, et cetera. On the other end of the spectrum, as we discussed yesterday, I was flying with NSORC, the Naval Strike Air Warfare Center in Seahawks at Fallon Air Force, um, Fallon Naval Air Station. We were both flying the same direction and as part of their sort of tactical flying, we'd get to a point, each would, the one on the left would turn right to come in, the one on the right would turn left to come in and they would come in on a real hard turn and they end up basically side by side sort of flying in towards the target. Well, the, air, the opposite aircraft to us came in a lot hotter as we turned, it was going to end up where we're going to both going to be in the same piece of sky at once, which would not be good. I looked as he came in towards us, I felt the pilot basically just grab the collective, hoist it up. All the lights in the front of the Seahawk went either orange, yellow, or red. A lot of bells and whistles and crap going off. The blades from the other aircraft were literally five to 10 feet below the fuselage of our Seahawk very quiet flight all the way back to base. They went in and had a chat about that scenario and the circumstances. And then the last one that um, highlights when you're working in a very three-dimensional area like bush firefighting in Australia, and as Mike alluded to, I'm in a privileged position where I fly with the New South Wales Rural Fire Service, Delpin, Victoria. This was on a fire in the ACT. I was out there in the air attack machine all the pilots had been briefed. Okay, you go up from the heli, from the dip site, up over this hill at this position, you drop, you come back over at this position and there was smoke everywhere. We were following the crane. The crane had gone over. We came up to pop over the top of this hill. 
And this pilot of the BK um, with a 100 foot long line, obviously he hadn't been listening to the same briefing that we all sat in on. We came up over the top of the hill and there's a BK coming towards us at about 150 feet in front of us. Again, my camera ship pilot, oh, sorry, the air attack um, pilot, a lot of expletives. We basically bailed away and down. Um, everything went light in the seat, cameras went light, and we probably missed him by, I don't know, 20 feet, but at a closing rate of 100 knots. So it's, it's just one thing, and we've all spoken about this before. As a photographer, you're also technically a member of the crew. So it's up to your job to keep your eyes out. It's better to say something and, yep, yeah, okay, cool, got that. If you don't say something, don't assume that the pilot's seen it because a lot of times they haven't. So yeah, th those are the ones that sort of stick out to me. Okay, gentlemen, well, thank you so much. We have to wrap it up now. Um, our time is up. I've got a hard, hard stop and uh, we're just a little bit over. Um, I, I suspect we may have to do another one of these. Uh, we may, again, we talked to previously about bringing some new photographers in. There's some options we have. But um, gosh, I'm grateful for the time that you've taken today to share the information, uh, again, with all these new photographers. I uh, hope that you guys each get uh, some interesting leads uh, from, uh, from this. Uh, perhaps they can email it. Uh, perhaps they'll uh, run into you guys at uh, Heli Expo this year in Dallas or uh, one of the future years. I suspect uh, you'd be happy to look at their work there as well. Uh, gentlemen, thank you again so much. Uh, appreciate your time. I'm gonna uh, go ahead and wrap things up here. Um, one of the things I do want to do as I wrap it up is uh, share the websites for each of the, the publications that uh, are represented and make sure that everybody gets credit. You guys should, uh, I'm certain, have a contact uh, page on your website where the photographers can reach out to you if they do want to share their work, if they do want to ask additional questions or anything like that. Um, so Lynn, thank you for Motorcraft Pro, appreciate it. Uh, Ned from Heliops Magazine. And Mike from Vertical, you guys, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having us, Dan. Welcome. Thank you. The one thing I also want to ask uh, our social media manager, Jasmine, asked me, uh, please drop your uh, social media links in the chat section so that uh, HAI can follow you. We can see, uh, take a look at some of your work as well. Thank you so much. Not, not the uh, photographers, uh, not our panelists, uh, the, the viewers. We'd like to see the work you guys are doing. I'm sorry, it should have been uh, clearer on that. Uh, what we have coming up next, um, we do not have webinars next week or um, in uh, the latter part of December. Uh, we've got the holidays coming up, and so we expect everybody's going to uh, be busy. January 6th, we will have a Heli Expo preview. If you've got questions about what to uh, expect this year, please tune in. That'll be a lot of fun. And on January 13th here in the U.S., uh, there's a new issue involving 5G wireless interference um, that's affecting uh, aircraft especially the radar altimeters, uh, radio altimeters, either one, whatever you want to call them, uh, which can affect different systems on your aircraft. The uh, FAA is looking at it. Um, we're not sure exactly what's going to uh, come out of it, but we want to have a briefing on the updates uh, for that. And so we'll have subject matter experts from uh, around the industry coming in and talk about that, uh, that issue. We do have a questionnaire that will come out to all of our viewers here very shortly. We do ask you to take just a few minutes to uh, let us know what you think, uh, what worked, what didn't work, what you'd like to see in future webinars. Um, if you have other issues for HAI in general, please let us know that as well. Um, we're always happy to hear what you think HAI could do more of, do less of. If there's a specific topic you think you can, that we could help you with, let us know. Best way to do that is president at rotor.org, send uh, Jim Viola an email. He does see every email. He does task the staff with responding to those emails. This is the last webinar of the year. Uh, we appreciate that uh, you joined us. Uh, we hope that you and your family have an incredible holiday season. We wish you the most peaceful, joyous, and prosperous 2022. I think we're all happy to look at 2021 in the rearview mirror. Until January 3rd, we ask that you be safe, that you fly safe, and we'll see you again very, very soon.